six years before LJN's Roll and Rocker for the NES, and a staggering 25 years before Nintendo released the Wii Fit board. Amiga brought the first fitness board to home consoles when it introduced the Joy Board to the Atari 2600 all the way back in 1983. Amiga isn't necessarily a name that most people today associate with Atari, let alone Atari games and peripherals. When people hear the name Amiga, they often think of the legendary Amiga line of computers sold by Commodore, and rightfully so. But in Amiga's early days, it not only created several games for the Atari 2600, it also developed an Atari-compatible joystick, and as far as I can tell, the first balance board controller for a home console, the Joy Board. Amiga's angle, however, wasn't just to be another third-party accessory developer for Atari. Not long after the company was founded, Amiga was split into two groups. One group would work on computer development, specifically on a project codenamed Lorraine, a game console with a keyboard, disk drive, and the option to be expanded to a full-fledged computer. The other group was made up of marketing specialists and designers who would develop peripherals and games for the Atari 2600. The company's split served two purposes. One was to give potential competitors the outward appearance that Amiga was just a games and accessory company. And so they set the company up to the real world to look as if it was High Toro and then Amiga Computer, a company that made game peripherals. And the industry said, what's that new company over there on Scott Avenue? And they went and they looked with their binoculars in the window and they saw, oh, joysticks, no problem, okay. <laughs> The other was to use the revenue that Amiga generated from its games and peripherals for the Atari 2600 and other systems to fund the development of the Lorraine. While some online sources indicate that the Joy Board was available from 1982 to 1984, the copyright date printed on its PCB board, box, manuals, advertisements, and pack-in game all state 1983. Reviews and articles for the Joy Board were published between late 1983 and 1984, so while the Joy Board may have been announced in 1982, it's fair to say that the Joy Board was likely only available from 1983 to 1984. The Joy Board, along with another Amiga joystick named the Power Stick, were introduced nearly simultaneously and marketed as part of the Amiga Power System. The Power System marketing umbrella also included Amiga's PowerPlay arcade game cartridges, which housed three or five games on one cartridge, depending on which one you purchased. The Joy Board worked by essentially mimicking the movements of a regular joystick. Directly under the Joy Board was a PCB board, and a black plastic square with a red, semi-flexible piece of plastic in the middle. Each red stripe represented a direction that would normally be pressed on a joystick, and in the very center was a conductive piece of rubber. As the user tilted the joy board, one of the red plastic tips would press the rubber disc against the PCB board, which it would then interpret as a joystick press in that direction. The entire system rested on a plastic base that sat on the floor. This base elevated the joy board and also acted as a pivot point for the player to tilt the board from. According to Amiga, the joy board could support up to 250 pounds. Although there were games specifically designed for the joy board, it could be used for nearly any Atari 2600 game. Because of this, the Joy Board featured a port that a standard joystick could be plugged into, giving the player access to a fire button. Since the Joy Board was sending the same commands as any other Atari joystick, adapters that let you use Atari controllers with other systems and computers were also compatible with the Joy Board. The Joy Board came bundled with a skiing game named Mogul Maniac and was sold at a suggested retail price of $39.95, although it wasn't unusual to see retailers selling it for closer to $50. The Joy Board's controls for Mogul Maniac were simple and intuitive. Leaning forward would accelerate the player, leaning backward would slow you down, while leaning towards the left and right would aim your skis in the opposite direction. There were nine courses in which the player was challenged to guide themselves in between poles placed side by side, as well as zigzagging through traditional single pole slaloms. The Joy Board and Mogul Maniac game received the endorsement of Olympic skier and longtime Chapstick spokeswoman Susie Shaffey, who in a Washington Post story from 1983 suggested that using the Joy Board was not only good exercise, but also an effective way to practice chussing. To further promote the Joy Board, Amiga signed on as one of the sponsors of a 1984 Special Olympics Celebrity Pro-Am fundraiser, where Susie Shaffey won Amiga's Celebrity Mogul Maniac Championship. Amiga completed two more games specifically designed to take advantage of the Joy Board, Off Your Rocker and Surf's Up. Off Your Rocker was a party game, or as Amiga described it, a fun-filled body play game that supports one to four players. 
Off your rocker was more or less Simon Says for the 2600. The object of the game is to repeat the color and sound patterns generated by Rock and Raleigh. After each successfully completed sequence, Rock and Raleigh will give you a new, longer pattern, which could be up to 99 changes long. Setting the difficulty switch to A slash novice will play a version of the game in which the player's turn continues until they fail to repeat a pattern correctly. Switch B slash expert position would play off your rocker as a round robin game, with players taking turns one after the other. Rounding out the Joyboard game's lineup was Surf's Up, which never received a full retail release and was instead sold in small quantities directly through Happy Valley Video. As you've probably already figured out, Surf's Up is a surfing game. The player controls a small yellow surfboard, with the goal being to ride the wave for as long as you can to earn points. The top of the wave is represented by a red line. Moving towards it will earn you points, but if a player stays at the line for too long, they'll wipe out. Leaning forward on the joyboard will move your surfboard towards the top of the screen, while leaning back will move your surfboard towards the bottom. You can move left and right as well, but no points are awarded for doing so. Surf's Up graphics were fairly impressive for the time. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said of the gameplay, which is often criticized as being repetitive and boring. Just as the joyboard could be used to play most Atari 2600 games, so could all three joyboard games be played with regular joysticks. Playing joyboard games with joysticks tended to make them less challenging, as joyboard games took into account that it was more difficult to make precise movements with the joyboard. Difficulties using the joyboard with traditional games that required exact movements wasn't the only issue it had, as just leaning too far in any one direction would cause the base to lift off the ground, resulting in the joyboard not registering any of your movements. The joyboard was also the inspiration behind the famous Guru Meditation errors in early Amiga computer systems when they crashed. The error's name came from the Zen Meditation game, a sort of prototype game that Amiga employees had created for themselves to help them relax. The object of that game was to sit on the joyboard without causing it to register any movements for as long as possible. The longer you kept the board steady, the higher the score. There's no official reason as to why the joyboard stopped being produced, but there were several factors that affected Amiga's business around this time. The video game crash of 1983 had hurt Atari's business and the appeal of video games in North America. The joyboard was already a niche product, and now it was a niche product in a shrinking market. Amiga itself was also beset with financial difficulties. Out of desperation to secure funding, Amiga entered an agreement with Atari in 1984 for a $500,000 loan in exchange for a future licensing agreement on an Amiga chipset. Commodore would go on to purchase Amiga later the same year and facilitated the repayment of Amiga's loan to Atari. Under Commodore, Amiga concentrated on computers, and the joyboard was long forgotten. I was unable to locate official sales numbers for the joyboard, but according to Amiga at the time, the demand for it was so strong that there were plans being made to introduce it for other systems like the VIC-20. Personally, I feel like this was probably a bit of an exaggeration on Amiga's part, as today the joyboard is actually pretty difficult to find, indicating that it likely didn't sell all that well. These days, a joyboard can run anywhere from 75 to 125 US dollars, depending on its condition and whether the box and manual are included. The joyboard never reached the level of popularity of Nintendo's Wii Fit Balance Board or even the level of infamy of LJN's Rollin' Rocker, but it still stands as a reminder of the Wild West, try anything nature of the home video game industry at the time, as well as the creativity of Amiga's employees. My name is Yahel, and I just want to say thank you for watching. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, you can do so on Twitter at WrestlesGaming. If you'd like to help out the channel monetarily, you can do so on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash wrestling with gaming. But most importantly, thank you for watching.